Hello everyone, it's me Uncle John. Today I am going to read Essex 6100 Gazing at Stars. Lily, nor Adams. There were certain events in Adams' life that clearly marked the beginning of a new turning point for him. His first bicycle. The day he scored a winning goal for his regional team and slept with a girl for the first time that same night. The moment the first woman he fell in love with agreed to be his wife. The day he became a father, the night he began to sleep with someone who was not his wife. He thought about uh, a lady's turning point in his life as he sat down on the bath, holding the oversized pink teddy bear tightly and ignoring the looks he was getting from the other passengers. The, beep, the bear had been too big to fit into his bag and anyway, he didn't want it to be uh, squashed. So he carried it proudly, pretending not to notice the laps and glances torn in his way, even as his arms were aching from the damp heat and the awkwardness of the large toy. Two more hours and it, it would all be worth it, he thought. Two more hours added to the six long months that he hadn't seen Lily. He wondered how much a child could grow in half a year. Would he still recognize her? This thought continued to worry him as the heat and the steady movement of the bath sent him into an uneasy sleep. Why didn't you call me last night? She had complained as he whispered hello. Adam was outside on the balcony. He took a long pull at his cigarette and looked over his shoulder towards the kitchen as he blew the smoke out through his nose. Sorry, I didn't have time, he explained. My daughter was sick and we were up all night taking care of her. He wondered if the people in the apartment below could hear him. Who cares, he thought. It's not as if they knew him or Lisa. Silence on the other side. Nelia being moody again. Baby, I'm calling you now, aren't I? He said. It was the first chance I got inside the apartment. He could hear the sound of chicken being fried as Lisa prepared the dinner. Lily had been given some medicine and was finally asleep and quiet. Yes, it's always Whenever the time is convenient for you, you, di you don't really care about me, what I might be going through. It's all about when you're free, when you have the time to call. I have a timetable too, you know, cried Nadia. God, not this again, he sighed. I already got enough complaining from my wife without having to put up with it from Nadia as well. Look, you know my situation. I did call you as soon as I could. You can't expect me to drop everything and come turning to you whenever you want, I have responsibility for Gase. As soon as the words came out, he knew they were a mistake. Nadia was half crying and half laughing and shocked. Uh, Major Manager spat out his own words back at him. I have responsibilities. I have responsibility. Who do you think you are? Trying to sound like a good husband and father? Don't forget, family man, it's me you are sleeping with. She shouted. She had a point. Adam admitted to himself. Nadia, okay, calm down. I'm sorry, okay? I'm just a little tired right now. I haven't slept in nearly two days. I'll see you after work tomorrow, okay? Silence again before Nadia finally gave in. Hmm, but he knew that meant that everything was fine again between them. There was the one thing he could depend on in the end. Nadia always gave in. Adam, Lisa called out. From the kitchen, she was a very efficient cook. I've got to go, baby. Call you tomorrow. Okay. He quickly slipped the cell phone into his back pocket, put out the cigarette and opened the balcony door. Dinner, Lisa announced as Adam and re-entered the apartment and walked towards her. The bus Bright suddenly, walking at him as he had it hit the back of the seat in front of him. He cried out in pain, then quickly grabbed the teddy bear before it fell on the dirty floor of the bus. Lucky for you, you brought along your bear for comfort, said the man sitting next to him. Laughing unpleasantly, Adam ignored him and stared out of the window, rubbing the sleep from his eyes. Not far now, he recognized some of the old shops of the small town they were passing. He remembered the first time he saw the, uh, the gray white f the front of this building all those years ago when he had gone to ask Lisa's parents for her hand in marriage. It felt almost like a lifetime ago. 
Here he was again, full circle back to where he and Lisa started. His past joy and present pain meeting with a bump. He gave a heavy sigh and moved the teddy bear to a more comfortable position. Lisa had finally called back after the many, many calls he made. He had back for forgiveness, claiming that Neria was only a moment of madness and lying that it was just that one time, the one time Lisa caught them, he remembered that uh, disastrous moment. Talk about coincidences. Of all days, Lisa just happened to leave her cell phone at home. And of all the places in the largest city in the country, Lisa's car just happened to break down around, right outside the dark little restaurant where he and Neria used to meet before going upstairs to her flat on the first floor. Dusty, poorly lit restaurants, very unlike the type of place that Lisa would go to, except on the uh, unfortunate day that she needed to use the nearest phone to call for breakdown assistance. When he saw her walk in and turn her head towards them, he was so shocked that he failed to withdraw his hand from its loving hold on Nadia. He was frozen in his seat as Lisa's face showed doubt denial, shock, anger, and hurt. Tears spilling down her face, she let out a pitiful cry and spun round towards the door. She almost tripped in her hurry to get away, to escape to view that was not of her husband lovingly touching another woman outside. She had stopped a taxi which mercifully took her away faster and faster from the side that had torn out her heart. By the time Adam got home, Lisa and Lily were gone. Lisa had grabbed whatever she could and run away to the safety of her sister's home. In an instant, his two words had come crashing down, and none of the, the inhabitants would have ever fully recover. He got off the bus and stood on the roadside, teddy bear in one hand, a bag of clothes in the other. There were no taxis, or public buses inside. It would be a three kilometer walk in the full heat of the sun to get to the house. Uh, he held the bear more firmly, took out the uh, address again, and started walking. Not surprising, Lisa got a divorce and was allowed to keep Lily. As far as the courts were concerned, she was the perfect wife and mother. She was even a socially aware teacher who gave a less fortunate students free lessons after school. Adam and his relationship within Nadia were blamed for the failure of the marriage, so it was hard for him to, to even get visiting right. It was months before he saw Lily again. Even then, it was at Lisa's sister's house, where all eyes watched him, accusingly as he tried to talk to his daughter, probably because of the unfriendly atmosphere, or because she hadn't seen him in a while. Lily behaved shyly around him, responding to him only after much encouragement. Until finally she ran and hid behind the mother. Adam had all wanted to ask there, and then when he could come and see Lily again, but the word stuck in his throat. As he saw the look of hurt, hatred, and bitterness flashing in Lisa's eyes, the same look he had seen at the restaurant, it was pointless to to even tell her that he and Nadia were history. He knew Lisa wouldn't forgive him and would certainly never take him back. So he avoided any argument, choosing instead to phone afterwards to arrange for the next visit. But the next time was harder to arrange. Lisa was often busy with work or really had art class or swimming, was out with the grandparents. He supposed he deserved it, but he still missed his daughter. Then one day, Lisa left a message telling him <clears throat> that she was moving to her parents' hometown. She had been transferred to a school there, and she and Lily were leaving in a few days. He tried phoning her back many times but couldn't reach her. He knew that any attempt to contact her uh, through her sister would be useless. He felt anxious and helpless. Luckily for him, Lisa did call back eventually. She and Lily had now moved, and if he wanted, he could have come and see Lily, but he would have to find a place to stay overnight. Adam accepted immediately and took the first bus there to see his daughter. Car stopped and the driver offered to take him as far as the town. 
So he arrived in, uh, at the house earlier than expected. Through the trees surrounding the house, he heard the screams of laughter. He soon saw Lisa spinning nearly around and around in the front yard. As they both laughed wildly, his heart ached with love, love and regret. He walked slowly towards them, unwilling to disturb the fun, but wanting so much to hold his daughter once more. But he waited a moment longer. It had been so long since his last saw Lisa smile, then Dilly turned her head towards him, inheriting the woman from her mother, and paused in her laughter. Lisa stopped laughing too. So she kept smiling as she turned to show his her daughter's view. The moment their eyes met, Lisa's smile dropped instantly and the guarded look in her eyes returned. She put Dilly down and held her hand as they walked towards him. Hi, he said. Sorry, I'm Ollie. Lisa nodded. The three of them stood looking at each other in silence. It was suddenly awkward. Lily's eyes were on the teddy bear. And Adam suddenly felt hugely grateful for the fact that he had brought it. Despite all the unpleasantness of the bus journey, he knelt down in front of Lily and said, This is for you. Lily looked up at her mother, who nodded her permission and gently pushed the Lily's hand towards the toy bag, toy bit bear, giving a shy smile. Lily took the bear from Adam and held it tightly in her arms. Her cheeks were rosy pink. Adam's heart swelled with so much love and happiness as he saw his daughter's shining eyes and her excitement with her new toy. She said in a soft, uh, soft, innocent voice, ever so politely, Thank you, Uncle. And Adam felt his heart break into a million tiny pieces. A child is born, a story from India. It was a hot, dull night in May. The air was heavy as a blanket, and the moonlit sky hung like a gray snake's head over the small mud hut. A man sat outside the hut, his hands holding his bony knees, looking like a clumsy question mark. He was waiting. Inside the hut, his wife arched her back, in pain as the midwife's fingers pushed this way and that at a swollen stomach. His mother watched her face expressionless. Soon the midwife pulled out a tiny crying baby. A girl, she muttered. The man outside of the, the hut swore loudly. His mother hit her forehead with her open hand and sighed. The young midwife sank back on the hard mud floor and tried not to feel anything. If the news had been different, she might have received the new sari or a few coins. She quickly finished the work and crept away into the night like a criminal. The man's mother finally spoke, you know what has to be done. The woman who had just become a mother knew what had to be done. She knew the women in the village did it in many ways. Some used the poisonous plant, others rolled the sari into a tight ball so the baby could not breathe. Others offered their baby to the river goddess. She wished her own mother had done in, had done it years ago. Then she shouldn't, shouldn't have seen her parents already heavily in debt, sell the animals and belongings to pay for her own marriage, and a marriage to a poor farmer who already had debts of his own. Girls, she had been told since childhood, but only tears and unhappiness to others and into their own miserable lives. She knew that a son who carried on the family name and promised a safe passage to heaven made his parents leave forever. Her husband's mother leaned over to take the baby, but the woman said, I'll do it. She wrapped the baby in an old cloth and forced some strength into her aching body. It was a long way to the river. She walked through the solid blackness, tripping over the stone until she heard the steady sound of the water. The river seemed peaceful, with no sign of the secret and small bodies that lay within it. The bundle in her arms moved, and although she had promised herself not to look at its face, the woman found herself staring into a pair of huge dark eyes 
The baby let out a hungry cry, and the woman quickly held it to her breast to stop the loud noise it made. In the quiet of the night, she gaped, gasped at the touch of the small mouth against the skin, and sat down suddenly on the river bank. Among the reeds at the edge of the waters, after a few minutes, she put the child down. Her fingers worked quickly, tearing the reeds and making them into a basket, just the right size for the newborn baby. She sent up a prayer to the gods. As she placed the daughter in the basket and pushed it into the gentle waters, she watched until the basket was out of sight. When the first fingers of the sun struck the earth, river, and trees to light, the woman stood up and began the long walk back. Family, Catherine Lim, story from Singapore. Money makes the world go round. It's a little, it's the title of a song. Money, money, money. Money affects everyone's life, but as yet another famous song title says, money can buy me love. When an elderly parent dies, it's a sad time for the family. The children come to mourn the dead and to remember the happy moments of the past. Money, of course, is the last thing on their, on their, on their minds. What should they do about the old biscuit tin? Uh, it was no piece of rubbish, no precious content. Uh, on, on on almost religious respect from the family, and it and in its presence, the quarrelling was reduced to near silence. It was a Jacob's cream crackers tin, and when they saw the faded green picture of Jacob, the man who started the cream crackers company, their loud voices quietened to gra to grateful whisper. The restless fingers felt the outline of his kind, the fatherly face on the tin. This was the face which had regarded the treasure all these years. But earlier, when they were clearing out the enormous pile of old biscuit and cigarette tins, boxes and paper bags full of nameless, useless things from on the old mother's bed, they hadn't the slightest idea. They carried the huge armfuls of the rubbish out of the house and into the backyard, made a great fire and put an end to a lifetime, lifetime's habit of saving. All the while shaking their heads and smiling disbelief, it was understood among adult children, uh, adult children that uh, old parents must have a safe, peaceful home. But old mother had made her house into a death trap. Your prayer candles could easily have set fire to all this rubbish and you could have died in your bed. You could have cut yourself on one of those nasty tins and died of a terrible illness. Living alone like this, you know that, don't you mother? The old one sitting on her bed that came out of her long silence to demand the return of the chocolate tin with the damaged lid. Bring it back. I want it back. After much patient questioning, it became clear that the chocolate tin with the damaged lid contained the precious load. The six umbilical cords saved from the births of the six sons and daughters over 40 years, each tied with yellow thread and wrapped it in lucky red papers. Mothers usually pre presented these to their children when they were grown up to remind them of childhood and a mother's love. But old mother had kept the silent through the years. In the silence of loneliness, each court has seemed to be laughing at her. I want all of them back. But too late to save the umbilical cords. The family searched uh, through the burning rubbish muttering their annoyance, but could not find them. Why didn't she tell us before we cleared it all out? She has been difficult as always. No harm done. Nobody would wanna want to keep those things. There were the things the old 
one asked for, and the family were forced to make more fruitless search in the burning ruins of lost memories. Then she said firmly, I want the Jacob's cream crackers tin back. They bring it back at once. There are hundreds of these old tins. Which one? The one I tried tied with strings. I want it back. Why didn't you tell us before? What is so special about the tin that you want it back? I keep all my jewels in it, said the old one, in a red cloth bundle. What a desperate search. Sons and daughters shouting for help to their sons and daughters rushed out of the house all together in a group. They put sticks and bare hands into the fire, the gasping and coughing in the heat and smoke. Standing at some distance, eldest son organized a search. At last, someone pulled out a completely the blackened tin, heavy with promise. The cover fell upon instantly, and the jewels spilled out like a river, flashing with the color and light. Quick, pick up everything to put them back into the tin and get back into the house. Make sure nothing is left behind, ordered eldest son, fearful that neighbors were watching. The joy and relief over the recovered treasure took away the hard edges in their voices as they gathered to give advice to their foolish mother. She hid her money in rice bags and vegetable boxes and then forgot all about it, talked for hours to her dead husband's photograph, and hoping to gain a place in heaven, gave the hard-earned money to the greedy monks who lived nearby. Mother, why don't you let us put the jewels in the bank for you? Mother, why don't you let us employ you as servant? Mother, why don't you let us remove you from this awful place of nasty neighbors and, and cheating monks? Mother, I'm a useless old woman who isn't fit to live with her sons and daughters, so leave me alone. It was always like that. They would urge safety, convenience, pure common sense, but she simply refused to listen. She thought she knew best. Last week, said eldest son's wife, using that special gentle voice that people use for an awkward old person. One listen, a, a burglar broke into old a poor fled and stole all her gold chain. She thought they were safe because she had hidden them, wrapped in some old clothes in an old shoebox on the top shelf of a cupboard, but the burglar knew. Leave me alone. The old one crossly took back the old biscuit tin, got up and carried it to a cupboard where she pushed it roughly into a pile of clothes. She locked the cupboard with a key from a bunch of bunch at her waist. Then she sat down and the tight lace around the mouth told them they should go. They should go and leave her alone now. The loneliness of aloneness was more bearable than having them all there. Mother, take care. Call if you need anything. Don't let anyone know about the old biscuit tin. When they were gone, she put her hands to her head and rocked from side to side, crying softly in her misery. Then she lit a candle in front of her dead husband's photo, prayed silent, silently to him. They continued to refer to it as the old biscuit tin, as if it were empty and worthless. They avoided mentioning its true value in case that might make it disappear in some way. But in their deeper, most private thoughts, they saw again and again the spilling jewel, shining brooches, rings, bracelets, earrings, chains, hairpins, and necklaces, the fell, uh, falling in slow motion, each con outlined in the firelight before it touched the ground and lay temptingly there. The memory of this wonderful treasure saved just in time from destructive flames and thriving neighbors gave them a stronger feeling of brave and selfless rescue than if they had saved a hundred men, women, and children from a terrible death. Now the treasure lay undisturbed in the old one's cupboard, along with the cheap little pieces of jewelry that they gave her regularly for her birthdays or the Chinese New Year, Second son's wife says she had managed to catch sight of the slim 
gold bracelet she had given her mother on her 65th birthday. The daughter said that the small jade ring she had given was the, the pitiable beside the richness of the jade necklace that old mother had inherited from her own mother. Both agreed that old mother was the luckiest woman in the world. She had treasure coming both ways, downwards from her own mother and upwards from her children. Both complained that they would never own jewelry to match a tiny part of old mother's wonderful collection and wondered when was the last time old mother wore those huge diamonds and jade pieces. Dutiful sons and daughters allowed to joke playfully about an old parent's wealth, but not to make any serious attempt to count up that tempting wealth as long as the old parent was alive. Now she was dying, so it was proper to ask, what should they do about the old biscuit tin? She was dying, and she had left no instruction. Upstairs, a monk was singing prayer to assist the peaceful passing of old mother's soul. Downstairs, eldest son gathered the family to make the important decision about the old biscuit tin, sell the jewel, then use the money for the funeral expenses, which are going to be very, very heavy. There is the large fee to pay those monks for the four nights of prayers that old mother has requested. No, the jewels should be not should not be sold. They are too rare and valuable. Anyway, they have emotional value. Who cares about emotional value nowadays? It's crazy for the dead to leave the living with the mountain of death. Third the son seldom spoke and was just soon told by his wife to be quiet. Share the jewelries equally. How is that to be done? And will that include the grandchildren? It was obvious. Why second son's wife said this? She had the largest number of children. No, wait, I've got an idea. Eldest son's wife became very excited. Let's have a two-step plan. Step one, separate the jewels into those given to old mother by us over the years. And those which are her own, her own. We each take back what we have given. Step two, divide the rest equally, each of us choosing what he or she wants, taking turns until it's all finished. The remaining odd ones go to second daughter. Second daughter was the last, least wealthy of the six sons and daughters, as the husband was a lazy man who gambled and wasted his time and money. Who has first choice? They were all thinking of the, the Krongsang, a wonderful new row of three hand side diamond brooches connected by a, a thick gold chain Whoever had the, the Krong Sang had the pride. All this first, but I'm prepared to give up my place, said the first daughter, conscious of a selfless generosity. Son first, daughters next, who said sons must come before daughters. For the first time, a voice was un unsuitably raised in a house of, of death. It was melted by the gentle sound of the monk's prayer floating downstairs and it was lowered. All voices were reduced to deep silence by a loud cry from old mother. Coming off from the depth of a sad loneliness, the silence was broken by someone saying, ask old mother, ask her what her wishes are about the old biscuit tin. A deeper silence followed, heavy with fearful thoughts. What if the old woman, as the last foolish desire, demanded to be buried with the jewels? Once a very old woman had insisted on being buried with a pair of extremely valuable jade bracelets. But no doubtful child, the dutiful child, had ever refused an old parent's dying wishes. So the sons and daughters concentrated on finding the best time to ask old mother uh, the all-important question. It has better be now, old mother. will die before sunrise, and second daughter's eyes filled with tears at old mother's brave determination to die. Before the first light of day, before any of the day's meals were eaten, it was her way of saying to her children, I go without food so that you may have plenty. They would show how much they appreciated this sacrifice on the day of the feast of the hungry ghost, when they would pile the most delicious food on old mother's grave for her ghost to eat. Meanwhile, they needed to know her wish about the old biscuit tin. The six sons and daughters went up the stairs as the monk came smoothly down. They nodded their heads 
and getting and said, Thank you, Reverend, but only out of politeness. Eldest son, as a head of the family, had the responsibility of asking old mother the question. She lay very still, looking pale, and making soft little noises in her throat, like the low cries of a bird. What would you like us to do about the old biscuit tin? Mother, he asked. She did not seem to be understood, understand. The others came closer, describing its rescue from the flames. They bent over her. A bunch of keys lay on the bedside table. They pointed to it, old biscuit tin. They repeated urgently, with all your jewels and hours inside, old mother's eyes flew open for a second. She tried to lift a weak finger, and out of her mouth, with huge effort, came one name, the Reverend. Uh, then she was gone. It was just past midnight. Postponed anger is all the greater. Outside the death room, the sons and daughters looked at one another in shocked silence. We can't simply hand over the old biscuit tin to do that monk. Mother must have lost her mind. That monk, what a hold he had on our mother. She was probably giving money to the monks without our knowledge. He had been visiting her for years, even before her illness. Stop giving people the wrong idea. Our mother was never as lonely and stupid as that. I'm not giving people the wrong idea. I'm saying he's an extremely clever and greedy man. He was able to deceive her because she has such a trusting nature. What would he do with the jewels? What would he do? How can you ask such a stupid question? He will sell them, of course, and use the money for religious purposes. He's been waiting for this to happen, pretending all the time to be offering prayers for her soul. The voices remain quiet in, in respect for the person who has so recently died, but their anger at the unfairness of it all, was rising dangerously. It was fully directed at the evil monk, who intended to steal their rightful inheritance from under their noses. As this son said, as head of the family, I make the decision to ignore the last wish of a parent who had clearly lost to mine. I make the decision to divide the old biscuit tin into six equal share for each of the six sons and daughter. Grandchildren will not be included. What about the ways of dividing it up? We went through this before her, but the doubt was silenced by the sharpest remarks of her from the first daughter. For goodness sake, let's be civilized and not quarrel about how to share. Let's get out of the old biscuit tin quickly and put an end to the matter once and for all. This has been a most upsetting day. Uh, the being head of the family, to fetch the key, he opened the cupboard and brought out the old biscuit tin. Frowning, he frowned him all. Tin on the table in full view of the other. Lifted the cover easily and said angrily, I thought so. It felt too light. It was empty except for a cheap gold ring and a pair of small earrings. Lying miserably inside on the red cloth. They're gone, all gone. All over the inside of the old rusty tin, as if to feel for a secret place where the jewels might have hidden themselves. Oh, do be careful, blah, blah, blah. Started licking the blood off a small cut near her wrist. Blood, tears, loss, betrayal, all were blamed on the monk. He's stolen all the jewels, gasped eldest son's wife. He took all the jewels from the old biscuit tin and left these two miserable bits. She held up the almost worthless ring Earrings in shocked disbelief, the monk's wickedness grew with every cry of loss. There appears hatred for him because he was the person intended to inherit the family treasure. Now that he actually possessed it, the most surgeon wish was to show him how furious they were face to face. Get him now, quick, somebody go and find him and bring him here. Force him to return the jewels. Suppose he's already sold them. Then get the police. Quite all of you, we have to use our brains in those dangerous times. 
Yet all of you crying and talking nonsense, of course, he didn't steal the jewel. He's much too clever for that. He worked his power on a poor, ignorant, lonely old woman, made her give them to him, a totally legal gift to the monks. There's no crime. Don't bring the police in. What are we to do? She was feeling very ill. Legal action. We shall have to think carefully and move fast. Meanwhile, the rules of correct behavior require all activities to stop in order to allow the proper funeral arrangement to be made. They were in charge giving instruction as the funeral, the rest were there, shoulder to shoulder, giving the impression of a family working solidly together. At a time of great suffering, a dutiful son or daughter was permitted no unkind thought towards a dead parent. So, Old mother laid out in her funeral clothes and attended by three praying monks was just surrounded by her entire family, all in black mourning clothes and with sad mourning faces. She had died just after midnight and that was very good. Said so the neighbors and visitors, and they began coming to make the funeral visits. It showed what a very thoughtful parent she was. Leaving all the good things of life for her children and grandchildren, dutiful son or daughter was permitted once more though, as long as it remained unspoken for the moment. It would have been better if she had saved herself the trouble of dying at the time and uh, left the old biscuit tin instead. The old biscuit tin lying on it, side on the floor with the insulting gold wing and cheap earrings just stood inside, which is stuck between the leg of a chair and the wall. Where eldest son had kicked it in a burst of uncontrollable anger. A picture of it rose in eldest son's mind during the funeral ceremony as he sat on the floor with his legs crossed beside old mother's body, surrounded by the other mourners. The thought of all the old biscuit tin did work, awoke his anger, changing the expression on his face to on a poisonous hatred that was hardly suitable for the house of mourning, the reverend came in, wearing yellow, and started to murmur his prayer over old mother, still peaceful body. At the same time, as part of the ceremony, he rang a small bell. The dead woman, the praying monk, the empty old biscuit tin, the three things together added up to the worst kind of evil, a wicked trick that had deceived the sons and daughters and grandchildren leading the rest of the family in procession round old mother's body, when suddenly for him the last change and forcing a son's daughter's duties broke. He was able right in the middle of the ceremony to plan for the, st plan the first step of the legal action they would take to get their revenge. In his mind, he started writing the statement he was going to give the lawyer she was a lonely, simple, trusting old woman with old habit. The sermon would begin, and in her loneliness, she behaved strangely, which upset her sons and daughter very much. Her actions were against her own safety and against the uh, interests of her family. The end.